In the early 2000s, it seemed that everything Eminem touched turned to gold. His debut album went quadruple platinum just two years after its release. His sophomore album sold twice as many copies in the first week as the previous record holder for most hip hop albums sold in the first week. And 8 Mile, a movie with a $40 million budget, raked in a whopping $243 million at the box office. But there's one blemish, tarnishing the nearly flawless streak of successes Eminem had early on in his career. The Slim Shady Show was an internet cartoon created by Eminem, Mark Brooks, and Peter Gilstrap that aired between 2000 and 2003. This was years before the creation of YouTube, during the era of flash animation, where sites like Newgrounds were the central hub for uploading and viewing this type of content. After its initial run, the cartoons were later released and re-released on DVD, with various iterations on the cover art, often featuring quotes from critics who've reviewed the show. The quote that stood out the most to me was this one, the Slim Shady Show makes South Park look like the Smurfs. In fact, this was the quote that was on the version of the DVD that I owned as a kid. And I remember, as a fan of South Park, it set my expectations extremely high. If you're an avid listener of Eminem, it's obvious that he's been a fan of South Park for a long time. Over the course of decades, he's dropped multiple references to the show in his lyrics. See children crocs abide uh -huh. And if you don't believe me, ask your diet Looking at me like I killed Kenny Gas in the tank, yeah, still plenty And starting shit like some 26-year-old skinny car God damn it! But when it comes to them trailers in them South Parks, muffle it Cause homie, that hood's tighter than Kenny's So it's not entirely surprising that when he decided to make his own cartoon, he took some inspiration from a cartoon he was personally a fan of. But usually when you're a fan of a thing and take inspiration from it, you'll pay homage to it, not ridicule or denigrate it. The cartoon was seemingly attempting to be an edgier version of South Park, though in reality, it was little more than a pale and juvenile imitation. However, if you consider edginess to be cartoon child nudity, poor attempts at celebrity bashing, toilet humor, or plot lines that involve starting a band with the resurrected, headless corpse of Kurt Cobain, then sure, this cartoon is real edgy. But it's a kind of edginess that just feels completely hollow. It's obvious that they were trying really hard to be gross and offensive, just for the sake of being gross and offensive. Not only is there no purpose for it, but the execution on every joke, if you can even consider them jokes, is just terrible. Throughout the entire run of the series, nearly totaling an hour in length, I only almost laughed twice. The first time was during the episode titled Movie Star Marshall, during the Johnny 8-Ball scene, where he's asking everybody if they want to do a line. Hey, need a line? Hey, let's go do a line. Hey, you need a line, honey? Honey, you want a line? What about a line? The behavior he exhibits here, coupled with his emaciated, ghoulish appearance, nearly did it for me. The second time was during the episode titled The Ass and the Curious, with this joke. Oh? Not, uh, Naomi Campbell, the other one. We met her at Scrotus a few weeks ago. Her name was... Deanna. Deanna? Deanna who? Deanna my DICK! <laughs> it's like the proto-ligma joke. While admittedly just as juvenile and stupid as every other joke in the show, the way it was delivered genuinely caught me off guard. Humor is often derived from a subversion of expectation. This was the only example throughout the entirety of the show where it successfully pulled that off. But why is that? Well, from the very start, the show is extremely outlandish and irreverent. However, you quickly acclimate to this environment, and it gets to the point where nothing they do will surprise you. It's just too much, too often. I think the reason the Deanda joke works is because throughout every other episode, the Slim Shady character plays it pretty straight. He never really makes a joke. He's just a cynical, violent, misogynistic asshole. You wanna fuck this bitch? You treat this bitch like she wants to be treated. Like shit. So whenever he's talking, you're not really expecting a punchline. But in this one rare instance, they successfully subverted my expectations by having him deliver a joke, albeit a puerile one. Most of the humor in the show relies on terrible, childish wordplay, like referring to Ben Affleck as Ben Affleck, for example. Hey, is that Matt Bremen and Ben Affleck? Or parodying the movie Armageddon with a movie titled Arm of Get It On, which, like, what does that even mean? Is that a masturbation joke? Hey, I was watching that! Am I supposed to just pay attention to the Get It On part of the movie title? Is it a sex joke? Is it supposed to be funny? It doesn't make any sense. A joke should have me amused rather than confused. I should be laughing, not trying to get inside the writer's heads to figure out what they were going for. But that's not even the worst of it. There are some extremely questionable jokes throughout the show's run. Take this scene for example. Yo, you got a point there, Stamos. Yo, you think you can hook me up with those twins? You know, them, them little girls? Yo, they look bad as fuck nowadays. Of course I can. 
They're total whores. At the time the show was created, Mary Kate and Ashley were just 14. Go ahead, have a seat. But I will say the show was a pioneer in one aspect though. Nearly two decades before controversy arising from Netflix's original Big Mouth depicting nudity of their child characters, The Slim Shady Show did it first, with a scene displaying Kyle Broflovsky from South Park doing a record scratch with his left knee, and a scene wherein the child version of Marshall Mathers whips out his underage boyfriend for Christina Aguilera. Uh, yeah. Scenes like this are arguably where the show is at its absolute worst. The show's art style and animation is awful, the voice acting is amateurish, there's inconsistent mic quality between the different actors. I can't believe they beat us that bad. How did we lose? I mean, they were just... There's a jarring record scratch sound effect that's used to transition between scenes. <laughs> and that's only scratching the surface. I could conceivably forgive most of these shortcomings if the writing was any good. I've enjoyed other low-budget flash animation of the past. For example, House of Cosby's created by Justin Roiland came out around the same time as Eminem's cartoon. And despite Cosby's reputation being severely damaged more recently, the show's premise is so absurd and hilarious that despite any monstrous acts the real Cosby has committed, it doesn't ruin my enjoyment of Roiland's cartoon. Think about that for a second. A Flash cartoon whose premise is solely based around repeated attempts to clone a sexual predator aged less poorly than a cartoon created by director of Metalocalypse, Mark Brooks, and Academy Award winner Eminem. It's kind of amazing that during the peak of Eminem's career, when his music often expressed sharp and scathing critiques of celebrity culture and political figures, that his show failed in every aspect so miserably. The show had absolutely nothing to say, aside from this one rare scene. Dave, why is it that if more people see your face, like on a magazine or television or something, people think you're like more important all of a sudden? I mean, what makes one person better than another person just because he's seen by more people? Eminem was viewed as a master of celebrity bashing at this point in his career, but it just didn't successfully translate to this artistic medium. The only celebrity bashing here is the literal physical bashing of their animated facsimiles, or the absolute shitty wordplay that results from replacing a part of a celebrity's name with a curse word, a la Ben I was disappointed then, and I'm disappointed now. I guess the lesson to take from this is that failure is a part of success. Maybe. Or maybe it's that no amount of past successes can guarantee future success. Or maybe it's that if you're really good at one thing, you should stick to that one thing and never venture out to try new things. Uh, I don't know. I'm sure there's a better way to wrap this up and tie it all together somehow, but I can't figure it out. Maybe I should just stick to my FL Studio tutorials.